radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. How you doing? How you doing? Fade to Black, this spoke radio for the masses. Uh, yeah, man. Today's Wednesday, June 29th, 2022. <laughs> I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer, and UnX Networks. Grace Hobbs, I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? Man, man, man. Here we go. Tonight, we welcome very special guest. Ralph Blumenthal of the New York Times is with us. I call him Professor. There's a reason for that. And tomorrow is another Fader Night with open lines all night long. What a week on Fade to Black, man. Robert Grant last night, huh? Oh, man. That was special. That was great. Really enjoyed that conversation last night. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I thought about it all day. I just did. And and last night. Um, before I get started, um, there is... Um, I'm, I'm okay. I was, I was resident to mention this. There's a movie called mad God. There's a movie called mad God and not for kids. It's not. It is stop animation, you know, okay? You, you know, like Sinbad, you remember the old movies, you know, stop frame animation. And uh, not for kids. Don't be fooled. And I'm going to talk more about this in a little bit. It, I relate it to the multiverse. I'm going to be talking about the multiverse here in just a second. Um, and I'll talk more about mad God. This isn't for everyone, but anyone that watches it needs to be an adult. I'm going to leave it right there. I'll talk more about it in, in just a bit. Mad God. Incredible. It reminds me in a weird way. Um, <laughs> And the movies are almost have the same title. Uh, it's hard to be a god, and uh, which is a Russian movie uh, about space travel and going to another planet and and an expedition to another planet, shot in black and white, and uh, an incredible movie. And I think for a lot of people out there and movie critics and stuff, this this movie will fall into their 
uh, top 10 list, all time great movies. And, uh, but most haven't seen the film, but critics, you know, in that circle, you know, the movie critics where they're sitting in a, sitting in a sidewalk coffee shop cafe in, in Greenwich village in New York or in Paris or wherever those, those people gather and they talk and they talk about filmmaking and, uh, and these great filmmakers, um, the bicycle thief. Okay. So, you know, you go, you go through those and, and in those conversations, it's hard to be a God, you know, they'll, they'll talk about it. And, but it, 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 in, it's hard to be a God. That's a film for adults. Number one. And it's not for everybody. It's a tough film to watch. It's, it's, it's bizarre. And it it's like another world. It's the multiverse and it's so well done um, to take you into an atmosphere that you're not comfortable with because it is another, what would it be like to not be on earth? Right. It just, it would be the unexpected at every turn. And that's what it's hard to be. God does. And it's the same thing in this film. This film is, uh, thank you for that. Ken priest. There it is right there. And mad God. You've got to check it out, uh, and, and and again, and I'm saying that with with a warning, uh, uh, with a warning from the word go. It's a tough film, man. It's a tough film, but it's really well done. Um, and now I just went to click on like. Ken, did you delete that already? I think Ken deleted his tweet. Why are you nervous? Are you nervous, Ken? I didn't think you you were the nervous nervous kind of guy, but uh, apparently so. Yeah, Mad God. All right, Ken, show me who you are. You better tweet that again. Oh, maybe he had a typo. That's the problem with Twitter. You got a typo. You got to delete the whole tweet. <laughs> you got to start over. All right, uh, I'll save the rest of that for later. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. The sandbox is hashtag F2B right there in Twitter. It's simple. Hashtag F2BQ. Any questions or comments during the show, post it over there. That's all you've got to do. Okay, Ken Priest comes back. Um, and let me see. Let me see this. Yes, he's a master. I agree with that. This is, it's. If you want to go to another world, you want to go to a parallel world. Okay, you know what? I'll save it for a bit. Let's get to the breaking news. All right. Here we go. It's one of those days. The FCC commissioner has called on the CEOs of Google and Apple to remove TikTok from their app stores citing new reports suggesting the video app popular among American young people is harvesting, quote, swaths of sensitive data, end quote, and is being accessed by Beijing on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party. In a letter dated June 24th, that's just five days ago, Brendan Carr, the commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, warned Apple Inc. CEO Tim Cook and Alphabet Inc. and Google LLC CEO Sundar Pichai of, quote, an alarming new report that shed fresh light on serious national security threats posed by TikTok. Carr went on to say, and I quote, TikTok is not what it appears to be on the surface. It is not just an app for sharing funny videos or memes. That's the sheep's clothing. At its core, TikTok functions as a sophisticated surveillance tool that harvests extensive amounts of personal and sensitive data. TikTok, available to millions of Americans through Apple and Google online stores, is owned by the Beijing-based company ByteDance, an organization that Carr asserts is, quote, 
behold to the Communist Party of China and required by Chinese law to comply with the PRC's surveillance demands, end quote. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Breaking news in the R. Kelly court case. R&B singer and songwriter R. Kelly was sentenced to 30 years in federal prison today following decades of sexual abuse allegations. Last year, after a six-week trial that included testimony from 45 witnesses in a Brooklyn courtroom, a jury found him guilty of racketeering and violations of anti-sex trafficking law known as the Mann Act. At the time, Assistant U.S. Attorney Elizabeth Geddes said Kelly, now 55, masterminded a scheme to target, groom, and exploit girls, boys, and women, end quote. For decades, allegations swirled around the singer who was previously acquitted in 2008 on child pornography charges. The, in an indictment following his 2019 arrest, prosecutors alleged Kelly and his team, including managers, bodyguards, and assistants, traveled throughout the United States, quoting here, traveled throughout the United States and abroad to perform at uh, to perform at concert venues and to recruit women, girls, to engage in illegal sexual activity with Kelly as far back as 1999. Incredible. Well, it's going down tonight. I'd like to say that I'll be able to see it, but I don't think I will. I'll tell you why. Virgin Orbit, tonight, immediately after the show at 10 p.m. Pacific, by the way, Virgin Orbit is preparing to launch a two-stage rocket that is carrying a precious payload for the United States Space Force. Known as the Straight Up Mission, it's scheduled to begin tonight at 1 p.m. 1 a.m. Eastern Time, from the Mojave Air and Spaceport in California, which is literally in my backyard. Virgin Orbit will live stream the event through the company's YouTube channel, which uh, uh, the links are easy enough to find. Coverage is expected to begin at 12.45 a.m. Eastern, 9.45 p.m. Pacific time, and include pre-flight operations and launch commentary. You will also allow for updates through Virgin Orbit's Twitter account. A Boeing 747 named Cosmic Girl will carry the two-stage rocket to high altitude. Launcher 1, which is the name of the rocket, is secured beneath the aircraft's left wing. Once it's at its target location, which is going to be 30,000 30, feet above sea level, over the Pacific Ocean. The plane will release the rocket, which will then continue to Earth orbit, launching seven Space Force satellites. Yeah, and I'm going to miss it. You know, you got to remember, yeah, to my, what, 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 I'm going to watch a plane take off. It's going to go west, fly over my house, and then head out to the Pacific Ocean, 35,000 feet, and then launch this rocket. But uh, I'm going to head out. I'm going to see if I can see anything. But I just kind of doubt it. All right. Well, more big breaking news. Mars rovers may have to drill down almost seven feet beneath the surface if they are to find evidence of ancient life on the red planet, NASA analysis suggests. Discovering certain amino acids would be a potential sign of extraterrestrials because they are widely used by life on Earth as a component to build proteins. Now, proteins are essential to life. We all know that because they are used to make enzymes, which speed up or regulate chemical reactions and to make structures. However... New research by the U.S. Space Agency has revealed that amino acids in the Martian surface are destroyed by cosmic rays much faster than previously thought. Current Mars rover missions only drill down to about two inches. NASA says that the first rocks collected by the Perseverance rover reveal the Jezero crater was once a potentially, quote, 
a potentially habitable, sustained environment, end quote. Wow. It's crazy. I'm telling you, we're going to get some breaking news off Mars. I mean, like the real deal breaking news. It's going to happen pretty soon. Let's get this show cracking. On this day in history, 1995, the space shuttle Atlantis docks with the Russian space station Mir to form the largest man-made satellite ever to orbit the Earth. Back when we were friends. I'm not picking you up no more, man, to go to school. No, ain't happening. Walk past your friend, your ex-friend in the hallway. No more passing notes. You're not doing nothing anymore. Ain't, ain't anything happening, man. <laughs> uh, who's going to break the ice first between Russia and the United States now after all of this? Who's going to, how's that going to happen? I just don't know. Here's your fader fact. Now, and we were so close with Russia. We had McDonald's and Starbucks. You know, it was, it was, it was so close, man. So close. And yet so far. Here's your fader fact. Now, out of all of my fader facts, I try to make sure that they're hard to believe. But true, right? Okay, strange, but true, right? I try to do that, and they're a lot of fun. And you can go and vet any fader fact. And tonight's is the most un unbelievable yet. Go and vet it. Ronald McDonald's purple friend, Grimace... Is an enormous taste bud. And that is your fader fact. It's true. Now, who is the marketing genius behind that? Right? We're going to have the Hamburglar. Makes sense. Hamburglar. Right? Makes sense. We're going to have a giant purple taste bud. A what? <laughs> a giant, grotesque, purple taste bud. What? <laughs> Think about it. All right, all right. All right but it, I, it, it, it's true. And we're going to call them... Grimace, because that's what everybody at the marketing table did. What? <laughs> and that is your fader fact. Tonight, we welcome very special guests back to this program. Ralph Blumenthal is here, one of the great journalists of our time. And tomorrow night is another fader night with open lines all night long. Now, let me hit this River Moon Coffee. Oh, man. Rivermoonwellness.com. Oh, man. All right. Yeah, Mad God. Mad God. Mad God. Click on the links over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Fade to Black Blend. Best coffee in the world. That's it. That's it. There isn't anything better. There isn't a better coffee. There is not. You think there is? There isn't. There's. It, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah. There. I, isn't that crazy? That is a giant purple taste bud. Okay. All right. Well, it appears. Oh man, it's too good. It's too good. It's too good. It appears that it appears that the most popular sci-fi subject right now is the multiverse. 
the multiverse started to get uh, started to gain steam uh, a few years ago in the scientific circles. And uh, and if you go back and you you do a little bit of research on this and who who said it first and what does it mean and 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 so forth, it never really gained traction. It just it just didn't. And there were several physicists that would talk about this, um, but no, no, it just it just didn't get any traction. And but you did. You had a few rock star physicists mentioning it, and uh, uh, specifically, I can point to uh, Brian Greene's. Um, I think it was Nat Geo, his TV series on on physics. Uh, which which was great. Man, it was probably 10, 15 years ago now. He was so young and fresh. But he he did one episode, and he had each universe looking like an Earth or, you know, like a planet different planet, you know, around, and and that each one would be a little bit different, and, you know, here's ours, and then and hanging spheres, like um, Christmas ornaments kind of thing and and that's how he kind of uh, positioned uh this imagery uh with this but he he was one of the first to kind of talk about this but it just never really really caught on and <clears throat> but one thing is for sure you know there are a few different versions of what the multiverse is a few different versions but it's pretty dang cool to fantasize about. The new blockbuster movies that are out right now, uh, released this year, have the multiverse as their co-star. Everything, everywhere, all at once. A fantastic movie. I've only watched it twice. I want to get through it a third time. I'm just really busy, but fantastic movie. And I just watched this week, you know, Doctor Strange, Multiverse Madness. Again, Different take on the multiverse, but it's right there in the title of the movie, Doctor Strange, Multiverse Madness. So I remember talking about this many years ago on, on Fade to Black, way before the current multiverse madness. And I had described what I thought it would be like if I just backed up my car in reverse, looking at Earth, putting things in reverse, and just backed up. Until I reached the end of it all, you know, so back, back, back up out of our solar system, the earth disappears and then, and that, uh, we're out of our solar system, keep backing up. And then we're out of the Milky way, the Milky way disappears into now it's just a dot, you know, the imagery and keep pulling out and all of the, all of the other galaxies are around, you know, to turning and we're in a venture, you know, get out to the edge of the universe and then back out of that. You know, and 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 I remember having some pretty dramatic visual thoughts about all of this, and 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 then you know exiting out of the universe, you know the grand exit, you know what would I see? What you know? And so you just keep keep pulling back, keep pulling back, keep pulling back, and I I have the same visions now that I had back then when I think about this. Because when you pull out of our universe, eventually it's going to turn into a little dot, right? little star. And it's going to have little stars around it. But those stars are universes, right? Wouldn't be stars. No, they wouldn't. They would be other universes. Now, the distances between these universes would be enormous. Stars, right? You know, and if you think about it... Um, it's like this, 85 billion light years across our, our universe, right? And if you're looking at other stars in this multiverse and, uh, you know, four, five, 10, you know, 400 billion light years in between. So travel between them is nearly impossible, right? Yeah. But it makes a great movie. That's what you would fantasize about. That's what you would write about, right? You know, we have the numbers for our own universe. We have those numbers, an expanding universe. But 
in the multi, one of the multiverse versions, uh, when we talk about this, is that in our universe, in our universe, there must be multiple, maybe infinite versions of you, of me. It's a numbers game, right? We know the numbers, the huge numbers. But things take another turn to another level in the multiverse. As big as the numbers are here, but if there are multiverses out there surrounding ours just to the infinite, holy crap, right? Now we're talking. Now we're able to investigate this. And the multiverse version and everything everywhere all at once, I like the approach to that. The way that it's dealt with in Doctor Strange, multiverse madness, I dig that too. And then... There is mad God. Okay? So, you want to experience the multiverse? You want to know? You want to just go? You want to tonight? You want to go and experience it? You want to go see something that you've never seen before? An absolute foreign experience? Mad God. Watch Mad God. From the opening scene with this thing, this dude being dropped on a on a on a chain on a rope down through and and that opening 10 minutes will freak you out of your mind and then as it continues and the things that are expand and 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 him ex- just go it is so otherworldly i can't put it into words it is it's that strange and that foreign and that much fun it's it's violent at times. It's it's grotesque at times. <clears throat> sexual at times. It's it's all of these strange things, but you wouldn't expect to understand anything in another universe, would you? Right? Okay. So it's not for everybody. It's not. But but I guarantee you, you're going to watch it, and if you enjoy, you, no matter what, you're going to hit me back and go, dude, whoa, I went there. Check it out. It's a great movie. The multiverse is here, man. The multiverse is here. <laughs> Just like time travel, teleportation, alien, alien, Amazon women on the moon, whatever it is, the films in the past. The multiverse is here. We're going to get many doses of it as we continue forward. I am your host, Timmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Tonight on this very program, it's the return of Ralph Blumenthal. He is here. And I'm very excited about the conversation I'm about to have tonight with Ralph. Tomorrow night is another Fader night with open lines all night long. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be right back after this short break with our guest, Ralph Blumenthal. Stay with me. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that knocks the net. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fake to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. 
The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Now you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pure Thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pure Thunderstorm 3 pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the UnXNetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the UnXNetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UnX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. 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 Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade of Black, I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, tonight is the return of Ralph Blumenthal. We're going to be discussing uh, lots of stuff. We're going to get caught up on the latest in the world of UFOs and UAPs. I'm going to take Ralph in that direction. He doesn't have a choice in that. But we're also going to discuss the release of The Believer in Paperback. That is going down right now. He's a distinguished lecturer at Baruch College in the City of University of New York was an award-winning reporter for the New York Times from 1964 all the way to 2009 and has written and co-authored seven books on organized crime and cultural history. He uh, co-authored the recent series of groundbreaking Times articles on the secret Pentagon program to investigate UFOs, led the Times Metro team that won a Pulitzer Prize for breaking news coverage of the 1993 truck bombing of the World Trade Center, and in 2001, he was named a fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, say that five times, to research the progressive career and penal reforms of Warden Lewis E. Laws. For more than 45 years, he has reported for the Times as Texas correspondent and Southwest Bureau Chief, arts and culture news reporter, investigative and crime reporter, foreign correspondent in West Germany. I need more breath. South Vietnam and Cambodia and the Metro and Westchester correspondent. He began his journalism career as a reporter, journalist, columnist for the Grand Prairie Daily News in Texas in 1963. 
His website is ralphblumenthal.com. I could continue. I could continue. It's the one of the craziest CVs in reported history. I would like to welcome back Ralph Blumenthal. Ralph, how are you doing, my man? Hey, Everybody. great, Jimmy. Great to be on with you again. Thank you for that great intro. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, I had six more paragraphs, Ralph. <laughs> It was like one of your articles, you know. To, <laughs> Unending. But, Thank you. <laughs> yes, right. And uh, let me, can, can I start off with a question that you've never been asked before? Say yes. Sure. No. <laughs> do, do you guys, I always picture journalists and professors and especially that deal with culture and the arts and, you know, throw in a little politics little UFOs, that you guys hang out at some sidewalk coffee shop, chain-smoking cigarettes, and discussing world events uh, to the wee hours in the morning. Did you yeah, ever that do that? That used to be. That used yeah. to be. But that's not the way journalists operate anymore. <laughs> We're hunched over our, you know, our uh, mobile units, and um, uh, we get to bed early, um, uh, don't drink all night anymore. So, um, no, that, that's the old style. Did you, did you used to do that, though? Hang out and Che Guevara and berets and, and discuss and ponder the significance of world events and, and change? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, when I started in the newspaper business, I mean, uh, you know, it sounds like the 2,000-year-old man here, but um, it was way before the, uh, you know, the Internet age, and we actually used typewriters, and we had to talk to people face-to-face in person, um, so, uh, we had to go to the library to research stuff. So, um, it was much more hands-on. It was a different era and we didn't know anything else. I mean, that's what journalists did. It was called shoe leather reporting and you right. went, and, you know, interviewed people in person and you hung out with your colleagues and you, after you finished your story on deadline, you went to the bar and you hashed it all over with your, you know, buddies. So, um, that's the way it used to be. Yeah. 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 It, that was only 20 years ago, by the way. <laughs> and see, here's the thing. Um, computers are great. The editing and, and things and the efficiency and sending your files and working remotely and all of that, that that's all great. But do you miss your IBM Selectric? Well, you know what I miss? I miss the idea of having a news cycle that ended. I mean, when you finished your story, that was it for the night. Now... Uh, you got to update your story. You're constantly on. If something happens, you know, uh, you have to file again. And uh, I mean, it's a 24 hour news cycle. So uh, it's, it's a very different world. I mean, it's good in a way because people find out what's happening all the time, but it puts a tremendous burden on journalists. And uh, I, I mean, I like the old way, but we, we can't go back to that. You know, in the uh, we're going to get to you in just a second, but having the opportunity to just sit here and talk uh, with you, Ralph, is is a it's an honor and it's a privilege, and I, I get to ask the real questions. So here's another one: um, in the in the old days when they printed paper, right? The uh, it was selling copies, right? Newsstands on the street, paper boy, you know, selling copies. And that dictated the news and and what was happening and, and the circulation. Is it the same today as clicks or is clicks a different mindset altogether? I know they're similar. A circle, I mean, a square can be a rectangle, rectangle. You know, I, I, I get that. But are they, do they hold the same value? No, you know, I, I actually teach a course on this at Baruch College, a course in fake news. I, I've lectured on this. Uh, it's it's a completely different world. We, we, you used to know where the news was coming from. I mean, you picked up the New York Times, the Herald Tribune, the Daily News, National Enquirer. <laughs> I mean, you name it. At least you knew that the uh, the news organization putting that out, uh, you know, was responsible for that content. And you know that trained reporters, or maybe reporters not so well trained, but you know, actual reporters were putting it out. Now the news is coming from every which direction. It's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, sometimes it's, it's wonderful. Uh, you, you know, you're getting news from non-professionals, people who just capture things on their cell phones, which is good. They, they capture police brutality, um, you know, live th th things that they happen to see, but you, you really don't know where the news is coming from. So you have to, everybody, every news consumer 
has to evaluate it for his or herself. So that, that's what's completely different. I mean, uh, um, the what we call the gatekeepers. Uh, you used to know who they were. It was the you know the established news organs. It was NBC News. It was the Wall Street Journal. Now news is coming out on social media, and you don't know where it comes from. So it could be good, could not be good, but uh, it's it's a completely different world. It's a, it, it's also a, I hate to say this because I use it. It's a cut and paste style of journalism. Well, right. I mean, people are you know putting stuff out uh, all the time, and they're taking it from other people, and they're putting on rumors. And uh, so, as I said, I mean, sometimes it's good because you're you're getting access to people who didn't have access to uh, you know the news, the, the gate, the, the gatekeepers before they weren't you know official reporters for a mainstream news organization. But um, you're right; it's cut and paste. People are putting two and two together, and you know, getting five or eight. And uh, it puts a tremendous burden on the uh, on the consumer. Today, um, you know, when you ever back when we were kids, you had a project in the house. Your dad or your mom would say, "Go get a newspaper, put it out on the floor, and we'll do whatever." And to, I, I work on. I have a lot of guitars. I was working on a guitar today. And I was sanding, and I went, "Oh man, I need a newspaper." <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one. You can't put a cell phone down on the floor and work on it. No, you know that's exactly right. I had to sand on a cell phone. And what uh, about lining all those parakeet cages? You know, you can't line them with cell phones. Training a puppy to pee. Right? <laughs> what are you going to do? I pee on my cell phone? Okay, all right. Um, now let, let's back up. Uh, be, I, I want to talk about the believer, and we'll do that at the top of the hour. Um, you. You must feel a certain, I don't know if it's like a beast of burden, right? I, I don't know. Uh, but you must feel uh, a certain satisfaction and responsibility behind where we are today with with Congress, with the Senate, the, uh, the UAP task force, the Department of Defense, um, and, and everything that has just risen to the surface in the last four years. Did you have any idea it was a great article and you i'm sure you were proud of it but did you have any idea that that thing would have this kind of legs no actually we didn't i mean when uh, leslie kane and i and um uh, um you know when, when we uh, wrote that first article in december 2017 elaine cooper the uh, pentagon uh, bureau in uh, times washington bureau uh, put that story together uh, we really had no expectations that it would, you know, people called it a game changer, a paradigm changer. Um, you know, for so long, the government has been lying to us about uh, UFOs, uh, uh, discrediting witnesses, uh, saying there's nothing to see here, uh, you know, swamp gas, you, you know all the stories. Um, uh, but then secretly, they were monitoring these uh, UFOs, UAP, whatever they wanted to call them, the unidentified objects. Um, but they weren't announcing it. And this Pentagon office had been operating since at least 2007. Um, and we were, we were able to break that story that the government really was concerned about these things. The only people who didn't know about it was, was the people, the public. So uh, it was long overdue. So we were able to tell that story. Uh, it got the ball rolling. Um, it is amazing where we are today. You know, a lot of people focus on um, what, uh, what hasn't been done and the shortcomings of the uh, 2021 UAP task force report and the shortcomings of the congressional hearings uh, in May. That's all true. But I, I really do prefer to look and see how far we've come uh, from a time when the government uh, really ridiculed uh, these stories and now they're pursuing them. Uh, are you okay with, are you, I said we'd wait until the top of the hour to talk about the believer, but when it comes to UFOs and UAPs, Ralph, are, are you a believer now? Did something change for you? Well, you know, I don't like to, uh, put myself in that category, Jimmy, because, uh, you know, what I like to say is it's like asking, first of all, you know, do you believe in, in the ocean? Do you believe in the moon? Um, the fact is there are these objects up there and in the water sometimes that uh, defy understanding. Uh, 
Um, and it's not a question of believing in them or not believing in them. They, they exist. The question is, what, what are they? Where do they come from? Who's, who or what is behind the wheel? All these questions that have, have obviously no answers. But it's not a question of do you believe that, that they're up there. They're up there because the Navy uh, instruments have captured them. Uh, there have been countless photographs over the years, some very good, some not so good. Um, but now at least the government is admitting officially that yeah, these are, there are objects, physical, real physical objects up there. And you can believe in them, you cannot believe in them, but they're there. So um, that's what I like to say. It's not a question of belief. Uh, you know, um, you don't have to believe. They're still going to be up there whether you believe in them or not. Are you the UFO professor? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You're walking down the hall. You're going to your office. You got to go grade some papers. You got to give a lecture. Do you, do you think about that? Whereas, you know, no, I mean, I have a lot of different hats. I mean, I, I lecture about journalism. I teach, uh, I'm up in Exeter now, which is really, you know, ground zero of uh, the UFO industry. Um, a lot of stuff happened up here and I'm teaching other courses as I don't live, breathe, you know, and, 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 and sleep, uh, UFOs. Uh, I think about them sometimes. I, I, respond when I'm asked. I love to talk about them. I wrote the book uh, that, you know, we're going to talk about, but I have other parts to my, uh, you know, <laughs> to my life. Now, um, the, I want to go back to May 17th and which was pretty extraordinary uh, where we had the house, you know, pull this together and have what some say was the first hearing in over 50 years uh, I think that the general flavor of that hearing, Ralph, I'm, I, I will say it was the first time ever because it was a different approach and there, and there was a reason why we were having that hearing. It was different than what happened in the late 60s um, and, and that approach. Um, but this time around, that was pretty extraordinary and we're about to have more. Uh, what's your, what was your takeaway as, as you watched those 90 minutes? Well, as you say, I think it was extraordinary that they even existed, the hearings, that, uh, um, you know, the last ones were in, uh, I think, 68. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Gerald Ford had a hearing. Um, and, uh, you know, we've come a long way since then. Um, so uh, that in itself is extraordinary. Um, I have, you know, a lot of uh, questions and, and criticisms of, of the hearing and what, you know, the two witnesses uh, uh, Ronald Moultrie and Scott Bray, top uh, Pentagon and uh, Defense Department people, Naval Intelligence people who testified. Um, uh, I mean, for example, uh, they said that they were not aware of any materials being recovered. Now, uh, we wrote a story in the Times that um, members of Congress were actually, or congressional committees were briefed um, and we classified briefings, so we don't know much about it, but they were briefed on um, uh, purported Crash. crashes. Yes, yes. You know, <laughs> purported crashes and recoveries of material. Now, right. we were not able to find out very much for the New York Times, and we, you know, a lot of people wa wanted to hear more, but we have to stick to the, you know, the facts, what we can confirm. But the fact that uh, Congress was actually briefed on, on the subject is interesting in itself. So they said, no, they have no materials. Now, th maybe they, the two witnesses, were being literal and saying that they, but both of them, were not holding material in their houses, okay? Um, but that didn't satisfy me. I think there's much more to that story. And um, they also testified that, um, um, uh, you know, uh, U.S. aircraft never tried to shoot down a UFO. Now, we hear differently. I mean, there are many uh, accounts that we've examined that show that uh, over the years, um, uh, you know, uh, Navy planes have tried to intercept UFOs and on occasion uh, took uh, hostile action against them to see what they were. Now, again, uh, maybe these two witnesses didn't know about that or it wasn't exactly in their purview. I think they worded it artfully, but um, that left a lot of questions. So, there, you know, a lot of things were left out of the hearing that were not cleared up. Um, 
But uh, the fact that there was a hearing in the first place is extraordinary. The uh, the comments uh, post hearing from Representative Tim Burchett um, were pretty. I mean, for me, for him to be so direct and for him to apologize to the press going, I'm not pointing at you. I'm just angry. And and for him to call all of this a sham and as an elected representative for him to say that we have been lied to by our government. The American people are being lied to, and this was a sham, and we've got to get to the bottom of this. Those were pretty extraordinary words yeah. on, about any subject, but this is about UFOs, right? And yeah. what do what'd you, th- you think about Timber Chet's uh, comments? You know, there are some very courageous members of Congress uh, who have taken the lead on this. I mean, Senator Gillibrand, whose amendment actually provided for this new agency with the unpronounceable name. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe they picked a name that no one would remember on purpose to keep it secret. But um, uh, so, you know, again, it's a far cry from um, the uh, unwillingness of members of Congress over the years to take on this issue because of the stigma. I mean, that's always been a problem. Um, and no one had the courage really to say that, you know, there's a real issue here and we got we to gotta examine it scientifically, not to believe in it or not to believe in it, but to look at it uh, with all the tools that we have, the high technology um, to that there is something real going on and we better find out what it is. So for a long time, uh, members of Congress weren't willing to take that courageous step. Um, and now uh, people, you know, like, uh, you know, Burchette are, which is laudable and, and Senator Gillibrand um, and Marco Rubio, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, I mean, that's encouraging. So some of the stigma is falling away and I think we need that in order to get at, at the situation to understand what, what is going on. Are the right questions being asked uh, by the House and, and the Senate at this point? And if not, uh, what should be done differently in future hearings, which apparently several are scheduled still for uh, 2022? Well, you know, I think this has to be a, an incremental thing, step by step. You know, there are national security considerations here. Um, you know, we're in the same boat with the Russians and the Chinese. These these uh, UAP or UFOs are not Russian or Chinese. So they are trying to find out, just like we are, what's going on. And if we, uh, you know, find out more than they do, we don't want them to know what we know because this is a race to that technology. I mean, this is extraordinary technology, the ability to cloak, you know, to, to turn invisible, to... Uh, turn on a dime, operate underwater, uh, reach uh, unimaginable speeds, um, uh, and to use a source of power that we don't presently have, nobody on earth has. Um, these are all you know, tremendous breakthroughs. So I understand that, that there's a national security element here. Um, uh, so th- this has to be done you know, methodically, step by step. So um, but I think the, the American public is entitled to certain answers because um, uh, our, our taxpayer dollars are funding, um, you know, these the, these Navy pilots and the technology that is, you know, detecting the, this, these UAPs. So um, I think the, the public has a right to know. And if if these things are extraterrestrial and they represent a threat to the planet and mankind, um, then that's something certainly humanity has a right to know, I would say. Um, so, um, you know, there, there's serious issues here. So it's a balancing act. You know, I'm not one of these people who say full disclosure, you know, let everything hang out. Everything has to be put out. Um, I think it has to be on a sort of a case by case basis. But um, I do think the government should stop you know, lying. And, and, and telling untruths, at least if they would say, we can't discuss this, we can't discuss that, that's better than putting out a fake story. Yeah, uh, certainly. And, and Tim Burchett's comments and others, uh, not just uh, uh, Burchett, uh, certainly uh, imply that the government and, and agencies, wh- whatever, them, right, let's just go with them, um, do know what is going on and are certainly sitting on 
secrets and they are not being clear about that. Do you believe that uh, there has been contact, uh, you know, with with governments and agencies and other state actors around the world? And they do certainly know that this is extraterrestrial in origin and and nothing Earth based. Well, they may know that. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if there's been contact. I mean, I'm not privy to that. Sure, I get uh, that. And I also think that um, uh, we, when, when we've written this, about the subject in the New York Times, we've been very careful to stick to uh, on-the-record sources, stuff that we can confirm. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of strange stuff floating around there. The, you know, the Israeli defense uh, expert, uh, who recently said that the Americans are working with uh, aliens on the moon, uh, you know, um, I mean, that's an interesting, uh, to say the least, uh, you know, uh, allegation um, uh, or, or uh, you know, speculation or whatever. I mean, he said it as fact, uh, but we, we need to see some evidence of that. And I, you know, I certainly couldn't get a story like that or wouldn't want to get a story like that in the New York Times without evidence. So uh, I, I just don't know. I mean, um, t- to what extent the government has confirmed certain things. Uh, I think they know a lot more than they're telling. I think that's clear um, because, um, for example, NASA recently uh, admitted or, or said that it was getting into this field. Now that's long overdue. NASA uh, knows what's going on at the fringes of space. I mean, between the International Space Station and the satellites, they uh, have the ability to gather data, for example, of objects coming into our solar system, okay? Uh, so that's long overdue. Um, but um, yeah, I, I just don't know how much, you know, they, the government really knows and is keeping back. But I, I would be very careful um, to put these stories out as fact until, uh, you know, we know more. And one thing we've insisted on in the New York Times is to uh, quote people by name. And we don't use unnamed sources uh, to say that, you know, a top security official has said this, this, and this. Um, not with these kind of stories. I mean, the, the, the paper does that with, you know, with certain uh, defense stories and, you know, military story. I understand that. We use unnamed sources for sensitive things, but I'm not going to do it with UFO stuff because the public won't believe it. Right. That's right. Um, uh, we're going to take a break in 30 seconds. Would it, you can almost yes or no this, would it surprise you if, uh, the air force had a flying saucer, not of this planet in hangar 18 at Wright Patterson <laughs> in Ohio? Well, <laughs> it would surprise me. Um, and on, on one hand, maybe not so surprising given, you know, the stories that are circulated, but, you know, the Air Force has been actually lagging behind the Navy in, in being forthcoming about this. It's kind of interesting. You'd think the Air Force would be taking the lead, but the Navy has taken the lead for apparently very complicated reasons. Um, so uh, maybe if anybody has one of these things, it would be the Navy. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, the Air Force, they ain't talking. They're just not talking. They're not talking. They're, I, I know what they're... Uh, we haven't talked since Project Blue Book. We're going to let the Navy run with this one. And I think that's right now, that's their method of operation. Let's take our break right here. Our guest tonight, the one and only Ralph Blumenthal. I am your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back after the short break. Stay with us. All right, taking a break. <laughs> Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack, a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens. 
The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder. But it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day. As an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. rivermooncoffee.com Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Ralph Blumenthal is with us. And uh, normally, I would say the New York Times, Ralph Blumenthal. But now I've, 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 I've kind, I, 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 I got to say, professor. Right. So, <laughs> but here's here's the thing. Um, when I was in school uh, for journalism, uh, broadcast, uh, television, radio, you do all of those things. Uh, and I remember one of our uh, teachers, instructors, adjunct professor, or whatever you want to call it, uh, worked for CNN. And I, I asked him uh, one day, this is many years ago, but I said, this is where my interest was. I said, so uh, what if you had a story about a UFO? 
and he shoots me this look. And this is in front of the class. And I said, would you take that to your news director? And he goes, no. And I said, well, no, I'm talking about, you know, you got a photograph, you got a video, you got this thing, you got, you've got the case. He goes, no, man, that's career suicide. I would never take a UFO story to my news director, ever. And that's, that's it. And that, that, even though that, you know, that's many years ago, has that changed? And, and what would you say to one of your students that said, okay, but what about UFOs, right? <laughs> what would your, how would you react to that? And is it treated differently now in the media? Yeah, it is. It, it has changed. And, uh, and that's a, certainly a good thing. Uh, the ridicule factor has, has decreased. It's still there. But, uh, you know, the mainstream media is reporting these stories. Um, and uh, now, certainly with the, with the government, I mean, I cannot overemphasize uh, how far we've come uh, since, I mean, certainly the UAP report of last year, um, it was only nine pages long. A lot of people criticized it because they wanted to, see, you know, to have to see more there. It was very minimal. It was very conservative, but it said that these objects are uh, uh, almost 100 percent certainly, without question, real physical objects. They're not hallucinations. They're not the planet Venus. They're not swamp gas. They're real things that we don't know anything about. Um, and uh, of all the, I mean, they had a very limited number of cases that they studied for this report, and all but one of them remained unexplained. They had one weather balloon, okay? That was, you know, we know that a lot of things that are listed as UFOs are explainable. Most of them, or many of them, are explainable. Uh, they are reflections, they are aircraft, they are drones, but a lot of them are not, especially uh, the huge... Um, you know, inventory of stories by very good eyewitnesses, including pilots, World War II pilots and modern day pilots, people like Dave Fravor, who we quoted in the New York Times. You know, uh, these are uh, our most highly trained observers um, and they're, they're eyeballing these things and they're being captured on Navy instruments. Um, so they're not um, anything except something real. Now, more than that, we don't know. But um, so to answer your question, yeah, we've come a long way. And uh, uh, I think uh, people coming forward now with a story wouldn't be shrugged off by, you know, news directors. Uh, and it's not hazardous anymore. Pilots are being encouraged to report these. Used to be, you know, if a, a pilot, commercial pilot uh, for, you know, um, United or, you know, American or so, uh, saw a UFO and many pilots have seen them uh, up there while they're flying. Um, they used to be discouraged from reporting that. Uh, you know, the, the airlines themselves that don't report this will be forced to send you to a psychiatrist. And now, uh, you know, it's different. And especially with the Navy taking the lead, we want you to report these things, uh, they said to Navy pilots. So um, we have changed a lot, Jimmy, and I think it's great. You would be given a desk job immediately, right? That's That's... Uh, it happened to the pilot of uh, Japan Airlines, and and he went public, and an extraordinary sighting uh, with radar, and the FAA got involved, as you know, um, and that's it. He was he was in a cubicle uh, right. from 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 that day forward, um, which brings me to uh, the ability uh, for you to to write a book about John Mack, which. Uh, the the exciting news is this is now available in paperback. That's got to make you feel pretty good. Yeah, I, I do. And uh, it's not only is it in paperback, but it's in Audible. So it's, uh, you know, you, you can listen to the book. Uh, it's on Kindle. Um, so you can get it instantly. Uh, so it's widely available. And I think this is a story that, um, I mean, it gripped me. Obviously, I spent seven, 17 years chasing. I never worked so hard on a book. In my whole career, I wrote, you know, a number of books, but nothing like this um, because I had access to amazing material from, from the family. I had access to all of John Mack's archives. Uh, I mean, we should probably say that he was a Harvard psychiatrist who was very well regarded in his field as a psychiatrist. And he won a Pulitzer Prize with a biography of uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, uh, he wrote a book on nightmares. He wrote a book on child, childhood development. I mean, he was very well regarded in his field, a very solid guy, um, brilliant. 
uh, who, through a whole series of steps I outline in the book, got interested in, in the stories of people who, who were coming to him and saying that they had encountered alien beings. And being a curious kind of guy, he, want, he didn't believe it, of course, in the beginning, but he wanted to know what, what lay behind that. And so the first thing he wanted to see is, are these people crazy? And, and he decided very quickly early on after talking to them, because they came from all walks of life, solid citizens, police officers and pr professionals, men, women, even children who don't, you know, who don't read books and watch movies at two years old, um, uh, that they were not crazy, that they were reporting some kind of extraordinary experience that he couldn't explain, but that he could not explain away. Unlike the skeptics, by the way, who you know, don't do their homework, Ever. and they, you know they they they're very quick to say, oh, it's you know sleep paralysis. It's uh, they're doing it for the money. It's uh, it's a nightmare. Well, it happens in the daytime, and these people are not looking to sell their stories. They're basically running away from the stories. They'd say to John Mack, uh, Doc, tell me I'm crazy, please. Well, as we all know, uh, Harvard put him through the ringer and uh, came down on which he ended up prevailing in the end. But it was a pretty dark chapter in his life to have somebody with his credentials and his background and his history to be treated like that uh, by Harvard today. That probably wouldn't have happened, would it? Well, maybe not today, uh, because we have become a little more sophisticated. But, uh, you know, uh, and, and Harvard was, no, was then no stranger to uh, strange research. I mean, uh, William James, uh, the father of, uh, you know, psychology, uh, taught at Harvard, and he was investigating seances and all kinds of paranormal things. Telekinesis. had no problem with that. Right, right. You know. But um, but something about John Mack rubbed them the wrong way. He was very enthusiastic. Uh, he didn't care what people thought. Um, he actually lectured at Harvard about um, these experiences, uh, these encounters people were telling him uh, with, with alien beings. And he, he taught seminars about it. Uh, he wrote about it. And um, so he was not, um, uh, you know, maybe he could have been a little more scientific in his approach. Uh, that probably would have pleased Harvard more. But he was an enthusiastic kind of guy, and it's an amazing subject. I mean, you, you know, we're talking about it, so it's obviously there's something gripping about the subject. It's not just a scholarly subject. It's, it excites, um, you know, comment from everybody. Uh, and uh, so he threw himself into it, and that rubbed, rubbed them the wrong way. So they convened a secret committee. I call it an inquisition because it's a word that they use themselves to say what it wasn't. <laughs> and you can't tell a psychiatrist, okay, this is not an inquisition. You know, this is not a black dog. Um, so he immediately said, well, why did they use the word if that's not what it's not? Um, and it was a kind of an inquisition. They inquired into his private beliefs, into his billing methods. Um, did he believe in UFOs, which was irrelevant? You know, things like that. So and, um, it was very intrusive. Yeah, and the crazy part about it, you know, it, it's almost the definition of irony, right? Where here we are in 2022 with Avi Loeb of Harvard and the Galileo Project, right? It's just that is amazing, amazing. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm glad you brought up Avi Loeb because I think he is uh, in, in the Mac mode, really of uh, bucking the establishment, um, not being afraid. Uh, now, he, he doesn't go as far as Mac in terms of, you know, investigating alien stories. That's not Avi Loeb's thing. Um, but uh, he certainly raised uh, some of the same questions about intelligence in the universe. And in particular, this object that came into our solar system uh, and then in 2017, I believe, and then and disappeared, flew in and out before anybody knew uh, what it was. And then only afterwards, through instrumentation, were they able to, or at least Abby uh, Loeb and his people said, this is not a natural thing. I mean, it, it, it speeded up. <laughs> um, it took a turn. <laughs> you know, so there's something going on with this thing. Now, 
again, it remains controversial. Uh, Oumuamua, it's, it was a, you know, some people thought it was a meteorite, but it didn't act like a meteorite. Um, so uh, he, he thinks and thought, and he put it in his book, Extraterrestrial, that uh, it was some kind of craft uh, with a light sail that picked up solar power and was able to accelerate. Um, uh, you know, who was behind it or what, or was it a buoy, um, you know, uh, sent into the universe by another civilization? I mean, you know, it was, speculation is endless, but at least he's exploring these and he is highly credentialed um, and very courageous and, uh, and fascinating. I listen to him whenever I can. It was podcast. I read his book. I've talked to him. Um, and I think, um, as you say, he's in the mold of John Mack. Now, there, are, uh, I, I did want to mention really quick, did you see the new movie documentary, uh, Ariel, uh, with John Mack? I did. I did. Um, Randy Nickerson made it, one of Mack's experiencers, um, who had, you know, an amazing story of his own. And he's been working on this film for years. I mean, we should tell you, listen, they may probably know that this is the story of um, a school in um, Zimbabwe um, uh, outside the capital of Harare, where in 1994 or five, I forget, um, 60 school children, uh, mixed race, were in the all kinds of kids, different kids of different backgrounds were at recess. And they saw a landing, or so they said later, and they saw two beings come out and they interacted with these beings through t t telepathy. And then later they drew pictures of what they had seen. And, uh, and no adults witnessed this because they were all inside when the kids were at recess, which is extraordinary by itself. Um, and John Mack rushed over there in the middle of the Harvard Inquisition um to talk to these kids and by the way he was very good with kids uh, uh, he as i said he wrote about childhood development he had three boys of his own um so he knew he was very good at talking to kids and he was not um uh, you know he didn't uh, put his thumb on the scale uh, you know he let them tell the story and uh, and it's on. You can see for yourself. I mean, it's in the it's in the film uh, of aerial phenomenon. Um, it's on. You can find it online. Clips of, of John Mack talking to these kids, and they told him the story, what they'd seen. And again, it was very persuasive to him because he said these kids were not talking about books they had read, you know, or movies they had seen. Uh, you know, these are kids. They, they were 10, 11 years old, and, and they were very credible in, in their accounts, and they were consistent, which is another thing that struck John Mack. Um, they were consistent and yet with uh, some little different details. Um, so it was not like they were all telling the same story they'd agreed upon. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, so no that's, that's the aerial phenomenon. Well, the reason why I bring this up, because your book, um, which is about John Mack, it, it, it's 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 great. But you don't have the theatrics, you don't have the visuals right to go along with that. And in Ariel, there was a moment where we get to see, in my opinion, uh, uh, a side of John Mack that. Uh, you don't really see from a, a professor or somebody from Harvard. And it was when he was speaking to the town. You remember the town hall meeting? And he was concerned with everybody's emotional well-being, right? He was very, you know, we, we need to talk about this. There's something going on. And his compassion um, for uh, not only humans and others, but his understanding of the psychological side of this and how people are dealing or are being forced to deal with the possibility of visitors from outer space interacting with their children in the town. This is about as sensitive as it gets. And he was like, he was like Joe Namath in the Super Bowl. I mean, he was, he was amazing, wasn't he? Yeah, he really knew how to talk to people. I mean, that, and that comes through again. You don't have to take my word for it in my book. You can find these clips online. Uh, he did a lot of, uh, of TV, by the way, um, and a lot of radio. He was on Oprah. And uh, it, it actually hurt him in, in some ways because this is not a subject that lends itself to, um, you know, being on Oprah. 
Uh, a lot of people made fun of the experiences he brought with him, who told their story. Um, it really uh, requires a more sober examination. And there was a lot of sensationalism involved and, and smirking. And especially, you know, there's a sexual aspect to this where um, men and women have said that on, you know, they, they're abducted. OK, they're taken by these beings onto some kind of a craft and uh, women have their eggs removed for hybrid breeding or reproduction or something, and men have their sperm taken involuntarily. Um, so there's the, uh, you know, very, very strange things. I don't have to tell you. So, um, uh, and, and that's a difficult story to tell on, on, on a TV, you know, uh, talk show. Um, it really requires a kind of, uh, you know, a sober analysis. You have to sit down and, and, and question the people. Um, and, and Mac does this, by the way, in, in the first book he wrote, Abduction, he, tell, he has, um, uh, I believe, 13 case studies where he spends a whole long chapter on each of these people. It goes into their, their background before their abduction experiences, what happened at the abduction as, that, as they recounted it, and what was the effect afterwards. And he looks at it from every possible uh, you know, vantage point as a psychiatrist. Uh, it's a very impressive book, Abduction, and it's not what you know people may think of. Oh, this you know psychiatrist of Harvard is 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 being sensational, exploiting these stories of aliens. He really uh, did a, a terrific job of analyzing what 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 was going on and what made these stories so compelling and mysterious. And it's in the end, Jimmy, as you know, it is mysterious. There is no answer. No one can come on your show and say, "I know." Only the skeptics, so-called skeptics, they have the answers. They know exactly what it is. But no one else knows what it is, including the people who, who studied it the hardest, like John Mack. Uh, nobody knows what is going on. It's just completely strange. But it, none of the um, explanations that are put forward are satisfying. So, so there we are. There... Um... There's another part to this uh, for me, Ralph, and and I know that I've talked to you about this before, but maybe you thought about it uh, uh, some more, which is there was something that clicked. There, there was a light bulb that went off, uh, just like anybody had a great moment of revelation, right? And something happened with John. And where he went from one side of the fence to the other, and he was able to connect the dots through these cases, there was something there. Do you know what that moment was? Do you know what that catalyst was that, that caused him to uh, uh, continue the deep dive? Yeah, well, it was really a series of things. Um, and I, I lay this out in the book. First of all, uh, he had a trauma growing up. He lost his mother at age uh, eight and a half months. His mother died of uh, appendicitis, his birth mother. And, uh, he, you know, he was traumatized by that. He, he never, he was, you know, child didn't know why his mother suddenly was gone from his life. So he really spent his whole life searching for this missing mother in his life. And, uh, and then uh, he started discovering, uh, he, he grew up actually, as I, I say in the book, in a very secular German Jewish household. His father was a professor. His stepmother, who came into the picture later, was a professor. And they were not spiritual people, particularly. Um, but then he started, he started experimenting with drugs, with LSD, and he opened up this portal in his, in his psyche uh, that made him think that, well, there's something more than just the physical reality. We, we you know, the, the four corners of our reality that we understand there's something else going on. And then he went out to Esalen, you know, that think tank on the Pacific, and he uh, practiced holotropic breathing, which was a breathing discipline that induced a um, uh, elevated states of consciousness, um, altered states of consciousness, um, like hypnosis, but uh, through regulated breathing. And he he, uh, he excavated another part of his character that he didn't understand, maybe a previous life or, or something. He was born back to his childhood when he lost his mother. So he realized that 
um, all these things that we take for granted, the reality that we, uh, you know, everybody understands, uh, we see, taste, and touch, there's something else going on. And then he meets Bud Hopkins. So, and Bud Hopkins was an artist, not a professional like Bud Hop, like uh, John Mack, uh, but he was an artist who got interested in UFOs and aliens and was interviewing people and hypnotizing people. And, and uh, Bud Hopkins turned John Mack onto the subject. But initially, John Mack didn't want to meet Bud Hopkins and thought, he, you know, this is all nuts. But then he, he jo then John Mack meets his own people and he realizes these are normal people. They've had these extraordinary experiences that no one can explain. So you ask, was there one particular moment? Probably the most, the closest to that is when he meets uh, Bud Hopkins. Um, and Bud Hopkins shows him a bunch of letters that he got from uh, readers of, of his books. Bud was writing about this before John Mack ever got on the scene. Mm -hmm. And John Mack said, wow, this is weird. Let me see if I can find out about this. Because he was courageous and he was the kind of guy who wanted to, to learn more. And, and somebody else might have turned his back and said, you know what? This is just going to get me in trouble at Harvard. I'm not going to do this. Why would I do this? I don't need this. But he said, this is crazy. I, I got to find out about this. And he talks to these people. They're, they're ordinary people, except they've suffered these weird experiences that no one can explain. And that's what got him started. I want to thank you. I know that uh, you've got to uh, get up early and, and teach. And, and I need you to be uh, the okay. best the best professor that you can. You're more than, if you want to do another segment, you can. If you want to... Uh, you're on the East Coast. Uh, it's up to you, but we need to take a break right here. What would you like to do? I'll come back for a little while. That's that's because you're Ralph bleeping <laughs> Rumenthal. Ralph, stay right there. We're going to take our break. We will be right back. And again, uh, Ralph is teaching. He's teaching classes. He's doing his thing out there. Uh, but uh, who can say no to Fade to Black and this fantastic, wonderful audience? I am your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back more with Ralph Blumenthal right after this short break. Stay with us. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. 2022 MUFON Symposium is in Denver, Colorado, July 7th through 10th, and it's on. If you can't make it to Denver, get the live stream. You can watch it live and anytime later. This year's theme is UFOs in the Spotlight. Our speaker lineup is incredible. Join Cheryl Jones, Peter Robbins, Michael Schratt, Kathleen Martin, Tom Reed, Paul Hynek, Peter Davenport, Dave Scott, Craig Campobasso, Donald Schmidt, Mark D'Antonio, and me, Ron James, for an exciting inside look at my new film, Newsflash, Congressman Tim Bruchette has just confirmed that he will be making an exclusive live presentation at MUFON 2022. Tim is the most outspoken member of Congress on the UAP topic. You do not want to miss what he has to say. Sign up for our live stream. Get all three days of the MUFON Symposium, a one-year subscription to MUFON TV, and an awesome free gift. What's the free gift? Find out at MUFONSymposium.com forward slash Jimmy. That's MUFONSymposium.com forward slash Jimmy. You do not want to miss a thing. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here, and I know what you're thinking. Lately, Jimmy sounds so fresh. He's so alert. He's so now. Well, that's because of biotech research and their new supplement, Brain Peak 9. Brain Peak 9 contains nine nutrients that may help support brain function of memory, concentration, recall, and improve focus. Other memory supplements can cost as much as 129 bucks for a 60-day supply. But right now for a limited time if you use the discount code fader that's right f-a-d-e-r just for the fader knots you'll get a 60-day supply for just 49 bucks there's no better time than right now to see what others have been raving about 
help improve your brain function. Go to BrainPeak9.com and enter the discount code FADER. That's right, for the Fader Knots. That's BrainPeak9.com. Discount code FADER. And the links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Click on it now. Seriously. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Hello, I'm Hakimi, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the lucky pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs> Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church, and I know what you're asking yourself. How is it possible that Jimmy can hang with Ralph Blumenthal? I do it with Brain Peak 9. That's right. That's the only way that this conversation is possible. And, you know, here's the thing, Professor. Um, tomorrow, you have my permission uh, in class to go. This is how you do not conduct an interview. <laughs> You're is- doing great, Jimmy. You're doing great, as am, usual. Am, am I doing okay? All You're right. doing fine. You know, it's... Uh, it- it, it, it's not intimidating. It's an it's an honor, and and I get to test my chops for sure, right? But um, uh, I would have never thought uh, when I was a kid that I, you know I would be in this kind of position uh, today, um, and to have conversations like this with uh, people as yourself and the guests that I've had on the show. It's just an honor and a privilege, and every show just gets a little better. Like every article that you write, right? Everything is is just one step further down the road. And that's the way that you've got to look at it. You're never a master, 
right? You never are. You learn. You learn as you go. You learn as you go, and I'm doing it right now, sir. So anyway, um, how will history uh, look at John Mack? Is is renegade going to be one of those words? I I mean, he was a renegade. I mean, he went against the established, uh, you know, when he started, when he got into this in the uh, uh, 1990s when he met Bud Hopkins. So, you know, it's now, what, 35, 32 years uh, ago. Um, It was kind of different. It was still a subject of of ridicule. It got him into a lot of trouble at Harvard. Um, So um, I think we've come a long way. We have got a long way to go, uh, but... Um, I don't think the same thing would happen today to uh, a professor who, who would study it seriously. Now, uh, he, he was not a quack. I mean, he, he uh, uh, had protocols for how he talked to these people. He, he did not uh, uh, influence them. He was not a big fan of hypnosis, by the way. Uh, he, he, he retaught himself uh, hypnosis. He studied it in medical school. Um, but then didn't use it much. And then he sort of had to learn it again, basically just to relax people. He was not a big fan of using it because he knew that um, uh, it was still a lot of negatives with hypnosis. You don't really know uh, what you're getting depending on how good the hypnotist is. You don't want to influence your your subjects. Um, And uh, so he was, he was careful. He was, really quite careful what he did. And you can, and I know that because I have seen uh, in my research, um, his taped, some of his taped interviews with, with people. He didn't know whether they call them subjects or patients because they were really neither. They weren't patients because they weren't sick. Um, And um, uh, they were a little more than subjects because he was uh, involved with them. They weren't just, you know, anonymous research subjects. So he, even Harvard couldn't come up with the right word for what these people were. But he was good with them. Um, so I think they'll uh, they'll remember him him well and deservedly so. He was not perfect. I mean, he made mistakes, but um, his heart was in the right place. There is, and and you. You discuss this really well in the book, how it's presented, but um, there is a line that that's all there. It's a visible, tangible, physical line of when you cross into, okay, now we're talking, we're actually talking about extraterrestrials. We're talking about something not of this earth. There's a line there. And, and, and when you cross it, there is no coming back. And was was he ever reticent? Uh, was he trying to stay on this side of the line, or was he okay with you know what? Uh, uh, let's let's just cross this. We're talking about something that is not of this earth, right? And we see it with media today. We see it with the Senate. We see it with the House of Representatives. You know, they'll go up to the edge, but very rarely cross that line. Was John was John okay with? with yeah, there's a big difference between John Mack and 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 Congress and and and, and the Pentagon. Uh, they are not willing to discuss this uh, because it is really um, outside the, the purview of of what has been uh, of, of what is um, provable. Uh, now Mack uh, was willing to to, to transcend that. Um, uh, and say that, look, I can't prove it. And he told this to the Harvard, uh, you know, Inquisition, uh, I can't prove this. And they jumped on, on him for that. But he said, this is what people are telling me, and I've eliminated all the other possible explanations. And you know what Sherlock Holmes said, when you eliminate all the uh, you know, impossible scenarios, what's left is, is, is the answer. Um, and he he went by that. He so he eliminated all the other possibilities. They were not crazy. They weren't making it up. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, it was not uh, sleep paralysis. It was not a nightmare because it was happening during the day and waking hours. And, and one by one, he eliminated all the possibilities. So he didn't know what what the answer was, but he knew what it wasn't. So, but the Pentagon is not going there. Congress is not going there, and I understand that uh, because uh, it's 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 one step at a time. You know, uh, first they want to understand what these objects are, and and hopefully, uh, um, 
reproduce their amazing aerodynamics. I mean, that's the big challenge. So whatever these things are, they seem to be able to, to do things that we are not remotely capable of. We, Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, nobody on earth can do what these objects can do. So that's the first step, to figure out what's their source of power, how can they do this, uh, how do they stay up so long, they're not, you know, drones can't do that, how do they operate underwater, um, and then, uh, you know, maybe try to figure out, well, do they represent an, another intelligence, an extraterrestrial civilization? But Mac wasn't burdened with that. He plunged ahead and he said, this is what these people told him, the most incredible stories. And by the way, when you read these accounts of people who've had these experiences, it is just mind blowing. I mean, you know that, uh, that these stories are unfathomable and you couldn't even make this stuff up because uh, there's no connection to any, any reality. Um, and uh, the stories are similar in many ways, but different in, in myriad details. So anyway, um, so that's what blew his mind. And that's what I guess captured me as a, as, a, as a writer, that there were these stories out there that to this day, nobody can explain. The book is a fantastic read and I've read it now a, a few times. And because, uh, you know, I've been interested in John Mack uh, for so long, but when you turn around and, and you read the way that you have presented it here um, as an author, third person, if you will, um, it's a page turner. And you have to put yourself in the mindset of John Mack and just think about what he was going through uh, in his professional career but was steadfast in his dedication with this. And when I say renegade, I, I, I truly mean that. And I hope that history is going to be the judge and look back and go, this was a guy that didn't give a crap. He just did what he believed, which is, again, the title of the book, which takes me to, I want to go back to the UFO hearing and talk about another renegade, which was Representative Welch. Because... When you had, you know, the two witnesses were, wanted to talk about uh, military and technology and drones, and they were trying to force the narrative of the hearing. And Welsh came back with, I want your take on this, because Welsh came back with, you know what, guys, enough of this. The universe is a big place. And this is what he said, right? The universe yes. is a big place. What about the extraterrestrials? Are they here? And then you got a little jaw flapping, right? And 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 he goes, okay, all right. Well, you're not going to answer that. But in the classified hearing later, are you going to tell us about the extraterrestrials? Th that is crossing the line. Yeah. Right? That, that right there was the focus of this hearing is not drones. The focus of this hearing is UFOs. And we know what UFOs are and what they mean in popular culture. Let's talk about that. What did you think about uh, Welsh's line of questioning and, and what he was trying to get them to discuss? Well, there were a few members of the committee who were much more, you know, aggressive and, uh, uh, you know, eager to, to, to get beyond. Look, the witnesses were very careful. Um, Gray and Moulton were... Uh, Moultrie were very conservative and uh, they stayed, you know, very close to the fact they didn't know about this, they didn't know about that. And maybe literally they didn't know, but, you know, other people might know. So they were very uh, careful <coughs> and cautious. But clearly, you know, Welsh and other members of the committee um, and Andre Carson, who brought the hearing in the first place, um, you know, we're eager to push them. We don't know what was what was said in, in, in the classified portion. That's interesting, by the way, that, you know, there's part of this um, hearing was uh, was classified. And, you know, and we, we just don't know. I mean, I have no sources to penetrate that. And even if I did, I, I wouldn't necessarily report it because I don't want to go to jail. Um, and uh, there's a reason we have, you know, rules about dealing with classified information. So that's not something that a reporter can very easily, uh, you know, transgress and make up on his own, uh, you know, decide that uh, I'm going to break this, uh, you know, um, uh, this embargo or, no, or not an embargo, but, you know, break this wall of classified information. There's a reason it's classified. So, um, you know, unless there's, there's some, some really compelling reason to, 
to break that story, but I, I couldn't break because I don't have it. I, I, my, my sources, our sources wouldn't tell us what went on in the private session. So we don't know. Hopefully that'll come out because if it's serious enough, it belongs to, to, to humanity to know what the government knows about extraterrestrial life. The, the leaks and the breaking news and the stuff that was coming out of the Pentagon and it seemed to be raining leaks and information there for a minute. Uh, it, has that been cut off? Has the faucet been cut off? Are you aware of uh, other information? Are there pending articles out there? Uh, what's, oh, no. what's been going on in that? No, you know, there have not been a lot of leaks about that, uh, Jimmy. Uh, there's leaks about a lot of other things. There's leaks about, you know, Ukraine policy and, you know, stuff like that. But uh, on this, uh, there have not been really any leaks. And um, uh, so I, I wouldn't say that there's that much has emerged. We just don't know. Um, I mean, the, the big outstanding questions, are there materials? Does the government or some private contractor working with for the government have access to materials or a whole craft somewhere? You know, the, the stories have been circulating for years, but they've never been proven. Um, and, um, you know, uh, have there been any contacts, uh, things like that? We just don't know. And uh, we'll have to be patient and see, but one step at a time. So I, as I say, I'm, I'm just glad that we're at least at the point where we can acknowledge that these UFOs are real. And next we can try to figure out where they come from and what they want with us. Well, in one of your articles uh, buried down at the bottom was that uh, now, I don't know if I want to use famous or infamous, two different words, a uh, quote from Dr. Eric Davis, attributed to uh, Dr. Eric Davis, that he told the Senate uh, in, a, in a briefing that we indeed did have a recovered craft, uh, flying saucers, not of this earth. And I'm paraphrasing the quote a little bit, but I think we can both agree that that's that's pretty close. Um, has anybody chosen to go back to Eric Davis uh, to take this a step further? Because it in 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 just in composition, it's one of the most extraordinary statements in the history of mankind. I mean, it's it's a big, yeah. big, bold statement. Um, is uh, somebody going to go back to Eric Davis to expand on that? And and shouldn't there be a journalist out there, uh, many journalists that would have picked up on that quote and said, wait a minute, this is the story of the century. The rest of your article was fine, by the way. <laughs> but, but, well, but, you know, yeah, that, was, that article, uh, first of all, let me tell you, when you write an article for the New York Times on a subject like this, it's gone over very, very carefully. And, you know, we went as far as we could go uh, with named sources and everything, you know, uh, that we reported was attributed, as I said before, th these are not unnamed sources, you know, a deep secret source told us this because people wouldn't believe it. Um, to maintain credibility with readers, um, we like to, um, uh, and uh, all serious journalists would probably agree, like to name the source. And so, so people can judge this comes from this guy who's an expert. And he said this and this. So we reported. And again, it was very carefully worded because it was what we could confirm and and back up that uh, he presented a series of slides to congressional committees that used uh, the words, you know, off planet uh, um, um, craft craft and 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 and, and materials etc but it was really whatever we reported and and it was in a slide presentation for congressional committees we didn't go beyond that and you know make of that what you will um we have talked to eric davis he uh, you know what we can report on the record from him we reported we're still in touch with other sources to try to get more. Leslie Kane and I keep working on angles of the story. We reported, by the way, we broke the news of the hearing, the congressional hearing before it was announced. We knew that that was coming. We didn't know when, but when we got clearance to report it, we broke the news that there would be a congressional hearing. Um, so we continue to, to work on stories, but um, uh, that's about as far as I can go on that. <laughs>
I, I, Eric needs to. Uh, yeah, sometimes somebody's got to be a martyr, right? I mean, you just gotta, you just gotta take one for the team, and and I I, I think it's okay. I, I just I just wish you know that somebody would have come at him. But here's the other thing with the media. Um, I think the media, by and large, has handled the last four years pretty well. Uh, you know, for the first time, we're not hearing, you know, X-Files music. And that, that part of it is great. But on the other side, we have got a lot happening at the same time. We've got the James Webb telescope firing off. We have tests. We have Oumuamua. We have exoplanets every single day. Uh, the, the conversation about what is going on. Uh, it was a great press release today out of NASA. Uh, uh, with amino acids and 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 things on on Mars, Th- this is really big stuff, and it's about to probably break loose, right? And it may not be with aliens in our atmosphere. It could come from the scientific community, and we could get some pretty extraordinary news on the heels of um, you know China, as you know, uh, a week ago announced that. They had two alien radio signals, extraterrestrial. That, that, that's, that's the Chinese. Yeah, this, but that was knocked down very quickly was knocked uh, down. because they thought it was, um, it, it was some you know, reflection of a signal. So I think that was basically debunked. Um, but my and, point being, yeah. this stuff is coming at us from all directions right yeah. now. No, the science is fascinating. And, uh, and, and uh, again, um, I'm one of the people uh, that has, I have no quarrel with science uh, looking for signs of, of mole- molecules, uh, even if they're not highly developed beings from space, to show that, yes, there is the possibility of life existing uh, other than on this planet. So uh, I think, uh, you know, the search for particles, the search for dark matter and dark energy, which remains mostly mysterious. We don't know what the universe is made of. We don't know what preceded the Big Bang. Um, you know, the questions are, we don't know what, what death is. We don't know what happens when you die. Um, you know, we, we don't know a lot of things. And I think it's great that science is pursuing these questions. Um, and, um, uh, and even if we find that uh, only you know, the, the only life we, we've come up with in the universe are molecules. Well, that shows that life can exist. And given that the universe is, you know, 12, 13 billion years old, well, there might have been other civilizations that came and went and developed. That's a long time uh, for, for things to, you know, for life to develop, come and go. So um, I think it's great. I agree with you 100 percent that it's very exciting that science is is making this, this progress. And uh um, uh, you know, somewhere that, that might meet what John Mack was, was looking for. Were you surprised? Last question, and then we'll let you go. And, and, and thank you, uh, for, for hanging out with us tonight. Great conversation. Um, after your article and your series of articles too, because it, it started on December 16th and 17th with you, uh, in, in 2017, um, but, After your article and all of the media coverage and everything that resulted from that, nobody jumped off any buildings. We we didn't have riots in the streets. The Vatican didn't collapse. Wall Street was just fine. And I think the world handled it pretty well, don't you? It did, but we we didn't produce any aliens. (laughs) So that's going to be the real test. But you're right. Uh, You know, Again, when you look at the history of how the government has handled this issue, they uh, part of the reason that they dissembled so much and didn't tell American people the truth was that there was some feeling that, you know, like Jack Nicholson said, you can't handle the truth. Um, So, uh, oh, we're afraid, you know, the, the humanity is so delicate that if we told them what was really going on with UFOs, then humanity would fall apart. I mean, that was always the subtext of why the government, at least our government, other governments, by the way, were much more forthcoming uh, in South America, the French, the uh, Belgians, uh, the Brazilians um, were much more open about what they were finding. But anyway, our government uh, was a very afraid to the, oh, you know, American people can't handle the truth. And um, so um, 
Uh, yeah, so nobody jumped off a building when the Navy produced these videos that we, you know, published in the New York Times that showed these objects are real, that they have pictures of them, that they're physical, um, that they're nothing like anything we have on Earth. It's not American, secret American technology. Uh, and nobody killed themselves over it. So um, I like to think that maybe with other revelations to come, uh, people will be able to handle that. And uh, and go with it because it's it's really very exciting when you think of uh, look we've been through many revolutions I mean the Darwinian revolution uh, um, the Einsteinian revolution Einstein uh, that the universe is expanding that uh, uh, you know all these things have have come along one after the other Freud to show that humans are not really in control of their own psyches, that they're these dark forces that rule uh, our, our minds and bodies. Um, and people didn't jump off buildings. So maybe we'll find uh, with the next revelation that there's life out there and uh, it might be highly intelligent, might be just microbes, but you know, uh, let's applaud it and, uh, and try to understand it and not jump off a building on account of it. Ralph, Professor Blumenthal, you <laughs> are, sir, a renegade. And I want to thank you for everything and all of your efforts and uh, continue to teach and continue to do your thing. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much. You mean you're great as usual. Thanks again. A real pleasure. See you Ralph, soon. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Ralph Blumenthal, the paperback is out for The Believer. And you can certainly go to ralphblumenthal.com for all of the information. What a great conversation. I am going to take a quick break right here, and I'll swing back to some open lines. Stay right there. This is Fade to Black. Hi everybody, this is Rob Halford, the Mental Guard on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, VX. 2022 MUFON Symposium is in Denver, Colorado, July 7th through 10th, and it's on. If you can't make it to Denver, get the live stream. You can watch it live and anytime later. This year's theme is UFOs in the Spotlight. Our speaker lineup is incredible. Join Cheryl Jones, Peter Robbins, Michael Schratt, Kathleen Martin, Tom Reed, Paul Hynek, Peter Davenport, Dave Scott, Craig Campobasso, Donald Schmidt, Mark D'Antonio, and me, Ron James, for an exciting inside look at my new film, Newsflash, Congressman Tim Bruchette has just confirmed that he will be making an exclusive live presentation at MUFON 2022. Tim is the most outspoken member of Congress on the UAP topic. You do not want to miss what he has to say. Sign up for our live stream. Get all three days of the MUFON Symposium, a one-year subscription to MUFON TV, and an awesome free gift. What's the free gift? Find out at MUFONSymposium.com forward slash Jimmy. That's MUFONSymposium.com forward slash Jimmy. You do not want to miss a thing. The Believer is the chilling true story of Dr. John Mack, a renowned Harvard psychiatrist and Pulitzer Prize winner. This is an outreach program from the cosmos to the consciously impaired. He risked it all to investigate human encounters with aliens. The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. Written by award-winning former New York Times journalist and author Ralph Blumenthal. Now available in paperback from High Road Books. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here. You've seen me with my thunderstorm. Now you can purify the air in your home and get healthy, clean, fresh smelling air and eliminate odors just like I do right here in the bunker. The Eden Pier thunderstorm uses oxy technology that naturally sends out O3 molecules into the air, which seek out odors and air pollutants in your home and destroys them. It's called a thunderstorm because it purifies the air just like after a thunderstorm. And right now, you can save $200 on an Eden Pier thunderstorm three pack for whole home protection. With this special offer, you're getting three units for under $200. Seriously. Go to EdenPureDeals.com and use Fader 3. 
Shipping is free and it's easy. Just scroll down. You'll see my name right there, Jimmy Church. Click on it and get your deal today. That's EdenPureDeals.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony, damn it! This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I want to thank Ralph Blumenthal coming to, you know, what an amazing conversation. And uh, I wanted to take it longer, but he's got to get up and teach class in the morning. And it's it's on the East Coast. and He's in Exeter, New York. And uh, so there you go. But uh, th- that was an amazing 90 minutes. Uh, he is truly a renegade. And I want to thank Ralph. The paperback is out now. Uh, for the believer, so uh, it's available uh, wherever you go and uh, and and get your books. Um, and he also, it's so cool. It's out on Audible as well, and uh, it's a great read. Uh, the believer about uh, Professor John Mack. And uh, what uh, there's there's a few takeaways. And and before I get to that, um, I'm opening up the phone lines. Uh, 818-921-6929 or 323-275-9695. Phone lines are open. If you ever wanted to get through right now, uh, they are freshly open right now. 818-921-6929 or 323-275-9695. Going back, we touched upon uh, when you read The Believer, and then you have the opportunity now, and it's it's never been quite like this, where you can go and watch uh, the aerial phenomenon, the documentary, and and see John Mack how uh, how he is as a person, but how he approaches the subject, and and how he speaks to children, and this is you know, and he's wrote many books on on uh, dealing with kids on, on very sensitive things and, and psychology. So, uh, and you get to do that now for the first time and, and you read the book and then go watch the movie. 
and then you can you know perceive the book in a different light because you're able to uh, see John Mack on film uh, it's an, an incredible opportunity right now that we've never quite had before um, the believer is a great book and to have it out now on on paperback is is just great so now uh, a couple of the takeaways here um, and and this is a serious thing and I'm, I'm going to go back to the multiverse too as well as I wait for uh, phone calls to come in is that there was something in John Mack, and he took it with him, okay? He he died. Uh, he was hit by a car um, in London, and whatever whatever it was that allowed him to connect the dots, and this is... This is a very serious point uh, with John because he's a professor. He's at Harvard, right? He's tenured. And yes, he had an open mind on a lot of things, but he was a very serious and respected professional. And as he is uh, interviewing witnesses and experiencers, and they started to mount up, he connected the dots. There was something that happened, and I don't know what that specific thing was. And, you know, I had always hoped um, that he would say, okay, this is, this is, this is, this is the thing, but maybe he couldn't, right? Because that pollutes and contaminates your your process and your methods and the thing with john and and let me explain what i am was suggesting here he through hypnosis was never going to ask leading questions he wasn't going to steer the session he wasn't going to suggest things no he wanted people to recall that's it right and you can't do that uh, ever and he wanted to make sure steadfastly that he never led he didn't suggest he didn't guide the sessions he didn't want to uh, uh contaminate uh the session right and and that's that's very 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 important so if he disclosed right publicly what that thing was that allowed him to go, wait a minute, there is something going on here. You can't, you can't let that out. You can't contaminate. And, and I get that, but I've always wondered, what was it? What was that one consistent thing through all of his patients and, 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 and clients and experiencers? There was something where he sat back and went, okay, you know what? Uh, I am, I'm dealing with life a little bit differently here. And, and that's it. So with that, um, I am going to mess around here. I'm going to put this on hold and I am going to, uh, okay. Now the calls are coming. Everybody be, be patient. Let me do this. And I'm going to come back here. Da, da, da. I'm doing all of this live and let's, uh, oh man, I just messed it up, but, uh, that's okay. That's okay. Let's see who we have. Uh, hi, you're, you're live on fade to black. Who's calling? Hi, Jenny. This is Lafayette. Hi Lafayette. Hello. How are you, man? What's going on? I'm doing good. Well, I'm I'm obsessed. I went back and listened to some of your old shows with uh, Chris Bled, the Bledsoe's. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's easy to find out what the government doesn't want to disclose by who they're trying to shut up. They're, they're threatening those guys. And um, Bob Lazar had his whole past erased. Uh, Mark McCandless slept with a 9 millimeter under his pillow over the ARV. So I think what they're uh, threatening them over is they said there's some group high up in our government that's trying to recreate the apocalypse by their own actions. 
That... And it's the same people hiding the UFO stuff. Well, uh, okay, let's go back to the Bledsoe's for a second. I have always found that very interesting that uh, apparently, okay, I, 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 I haven't been there. I haven't seen this for myself, but I've certainly heard enough uh, about uh, the Bledsoe's that the CIA was was interested in, and government agencies were interested and they were going out to his property and and seeing this phenomenon for themselves and discussing with him uh, what was going on. It wasn't uh, uh, in, it, well, there's interest from the UFO community, but why would um, in some sense, uh, in a very public way, why would the CIA and other agents, agents, you know, from agencies converge on his house? What is it that they were interested in? Because uh, the things that he was, uh, you know, saying, uh, not only on this program, but but others and through other people, um, he had a very unique situation out there that may even have a religious component to it. Um, what is the interest there from the agencies, unless they knew this going in and that they knew that uh, Chris's interaction and information was real and they needed to pursue this? And I've always found that interesting, Lafayette. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Well, the Fatima uh, spirit or angelic being seems to be, you know, she would chat with the little kids about politics. So she seems to be way into her politics. And she's the one that's saying there's these people high up in our government that are trying to bring on the apocalypse. And that also explains the plague of 2020. And that's the only logical explanation. Some ideological uh, fanatic is trying to self-fulfill the end of the world prophecy. But it's actually not the end of the world. It's just, as I said earlier uh, on other shows, this huge fireball that began the uh, younger Dryas was a methane fireball because the temperatures shot up like seven degrees globally just before it happened. That's too much of a coincidence for an impact or any other explanation. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate your insight. I think that, and, and opinions matter. Um, I think that's a little, I mean, for me, that's a, a little extreme. Is it possible? Sure, it, it, it is. Um, I, to have, I don't think anybody, and that includes Chris Bledsoe, nobody wants to suddenly become a prophet. Nobody wants to say that I have information that, you know, about the future and this is what's going, nobody wants to be that person. You, you don't. And even if it's true and real, you don't want that. And, and I, I wouldn't ever want to be in that position. And so for no. Chris to come forward, and I remember uh, talking to him about this a couple of times, um, and you could just tell he, he he doesn't want to be that person. He doesn't want to talk about it. And no, and plus it's so depressing too. It's you know earthquakes down the center of a continent. That's another sign for the uh, pole shift. That's the line of travel, seventy degrees west. It's that chunk of iron up in Canada, the geomagnetic pole is going to reunite with the liquid magnetic pole, the dip pole, when it uh, when we have the pole, when that Arctic firestorm happens, it creates a UFO effect that lifts it up. Well, and, and, and then it's going to travel. You know, I was, uh, uh, you know, I've talked about that a lot. And uh, if we go uh, throughout history and into deep history, um, the poles have shifted and moved and are moving right now all the time. And you, right. what most people don't understand, the center of our planet isn't rocks. You know, you go down, uh, uh, you know, a few miles, it, it's, it's molten. It's liquid. Yep, it's liquid. It's liquid. That's it. Magnetic and, hydrodynamics. Uh, 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 magnetic. Uh, it's, it, it's metals and it's irons and it's hot and it's moving all the time. And it's always done that period. Our continents, we, we Lafayette, uh, let me, let me be very direct. We today in the last 
uh, you know, if we go back through recorded history. So let's say, let's call it 5,000 years, okay? Very short period of time over four and a half billion years. 5,000 years. We think the land that we walk on has always been here. That's what we think, that this is the way it's always been. No, it has been nothing but movement. And we will continue to move. I don't know uh, what it would be like if suddenly uh, North America, you know, shifts uh, 2,000 miles to the West, right? (laughs) What what, go north what, south. what what kind of uh, earthquakes and tsunamis and devastation would happen from that? But it happens all the time, all the time, well, over, all over of hundreds, of, over tens of thousands of years. Yeah. Just, we just have these huge moves uh, up, down, sideways, uh, and and that's that's the truth of the matter. There is no other way to look at it. It's going to happen again. And uh, when when people, I'm not being some doomsday guy. I'm just talking about nature, and and that's just the way that it is. And and so when I had Scott Creighton on the show uh, a couple of weeks ago, and and his that was a his good show. oh his his book, man, uh, the Great Pyramid Hoax, um, is uh, the the uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the new one is called the Great Pyramid Hoax. Was uh, his his other book? Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, the the great the Void Enigma, right? The new book, and he talks about um, the Earth flipped twice in recorded history, right? And 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 so to have this in in documentation that the the stars are are tripping out right <laughs> that's it yep. right uh, everything they is move. backwards <laughs> that the sun is 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 rising in the west and setting in the east it wasn't doing that a couple of weeks ago what is going on yeah, yeah. and now we the, just near the pivot too. Now, so it's a safer place to live. Well, one would say, uh, when hearing something like that, and it's difficult, that that's imagination. But it wasn't just one culture. It wasn't just one group of people talking about this. It was many. Now, yeah. what would happen today if the earth went, right, and flipped upside down? Now, think about that for a second. And according to his research, it happened over a two-week period. It took two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. And and suddenly you've got the sun, right? And then it flipped back again and went back to the correct orientation. I'm, I'm, I'm blown away with that. And this isn't, Mm -hmm. this isn't, uh, you know, a million years ago. You know, where, you know, um, archaeologists, geologists have measured the magnetic properties of the rocks and some that the pole shift happened four and a half million years ago. We're not talking about that. We're talking about yeah. recently. There was all that melting, that flooding. That's because the ice gets displaced where it's warmer and it melts right away. And, and, and Randall Carlson talks about the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are many accounts of this. And so what what do we do with that? Right. What do we do? Well, okay. If, uh, if, if Chris Bledsoe has been shown something like this is, do you, do you go public with it? Right. Do you, do you let it go? No, I'm I'm talking about in in the grand scale, right? Do you go, do do you tell the world, does the CIA go, okay, this is what's happening. Uh, we just went yeah, checked. Exactly. And, That's why they're not disclosing, right? Yeah, because well, a lot of people are going to die. Um, they may have gone to the future in, in UFOs because if they travel faster than the speed of light, they can go backwards in time, too. 
Uh, yeah, so, you know, all theoretical, but I think uh, when it comes yeah, yeah. to that. Well, I mean, across timelines, you can't travel on your own, for yeah. paradox reasons, but it's well, anything probably a else. lot of timelines in the future end with this in just a few years. Sure, sure. And, if, they're using, if you're using the apocalypse timeline, that's the same one I use for the mid-30s for the pole shift, based on 1877 being the uh, uh, date to start with when the internal combustion engine got a patent. So you just you there's five months of the fifth angel, which is 150 years in their time. It's all allegorical. It's probably written by a secret society too. That book kind of snuck into the Bible. Well, um, let's say uh, that we've we've got a situation like the movie Don't Look Up, right? Where suddenly we've got six months before impact. Right on Earth, like uh, you know, a a major Mm -hmm. impact. What do you do? Right? What do you do? What do you do with that? And do you not tell anybody because there's nothing you can do about it? And and maybe you just want to live out the last six months uh, normally, or do you disclose to the world that you've got six months and that's it? It's over. Um, and then you have six months of madness. I mean, it would be truly uh, a really bad experience over the, you know, that six month period. So what do you do? And that's, I think that that is a position, like I said, nobody would really want to be that person. You know, nobody, nobody really would. And that's one of the things that I thought that don't look up, um, as funny as the movie was, um, I think it was a really hard look at society. It it was. It was like, you know what? Um, it, what, what was the, you know, I've seen the enemy and he is us, right? And Or it's hard to laugh at yourself. Whatever it is, right? You can look at any way uh, you want with don't look up. But it was a hard look at society and the way that we perceive ourselves and how something like this would be dealt with. And I, I don't know. I don't know when. Uh, well, this one, this one is preventable. We could save billions of lives if we stop it. There's, you know, tons of methane under the ocean. If it gets too warm, that stuff comes out. And we're doomed. But also, the major gas that's warming us isn't carbon dioxide. It's the methane. They've, there's a conspiracy around this. They compare it over a hundred year period instead of a one year period. And a one year period, it's like probably ninety eight percent of the warming is from methane. And it's some of the clues that and how the lady talked to. Uh, Chris Bledsoe, she she appeared as a bull once, and they heard mooing outside. And cows are like um, fourteen percent, almost fourteen percent of the methane that's in the atmosphere. We, probably with bacteria in their guts, we could solve a lot of it and lower it enough to to, to delay it so that it will no longer be along the uh, timeline of the Book of Revelation. Yeah, it, and that should be uh, enough. Yeah, ex- okay. Except, and I, and I appreciate that. But here's the deal. You're never going to be in control of Mother Nature. You're never going to be in control of celestial and, and cosmic events. You, you just are not. You're not going to be right, in control it's an of... Impact, but, but, yeah, gonna, yeah, but you can't stop an impact. Uh, La, Lafayette, let me, Lafayette, let me finish. Always remember okay. whose show this is. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. You can't control an EMF. You can't control right. yeah, yeah, that's- Lafayette. Let me finish. Okay. You okay. can't control these things. You can't control earthquakes. You're not going to control a methane burp. And uh, I think that dinosaurs uh, have a lot to say about this, right? That overnight, overnight. And if, uh, and this is the cyclical thing that we're always going to go through. And so when, <clears throat> if, if 65 million years ago, if that asteroid doesn't impact Earth in the Gulf of Mexico, there is no you. There's no you. There, you, you. Right, that is you, the other side of it. You will, you, humanity, the internet, right? Twitter would never had existed. So this is part of the cyclical thing. Now, uh, would if if that if that impact hadn't happened, 
65 million years later, are, are the dinosaurs building radio telescopes and reaching out to the heavens? I don't know. I don't know. Possible. Anything is possible. Or does E.T. Uh, cruise by this planet and just see Brontosaurus, right? And, and, and there's no humans, and that's what is existing on this planet. And do they consider that intelligent life? Right. And our planet has gone through that five times, maybe six. Right. Where everything, yep. everything on this planet was wiped out. The um, atmospheric conditions 65 million years ago, it was full of methane. Those dinosaurs were fart machines. Right. And it was a different, it was a different climate. And so humans wouldn't have existed. It was a different atmosphere. And that, that impact from that asteroid changed the atmosphere. And that's, it's, it's just a crazy thing. You are not ever going to stop nature. It's going to do its thing, whatever it is, whether it's celestial, it's cosmic, it's uh, it's something internal here. It's it's the the continents shifting. Uh, any anything could happen. Anything could happen. The uh, the other part, okay. Uh, Mars ended. All right. A couple of things happened, um, and it's all theoretical. But one of the things uh, that is suggested that this gnarly EMF came through. Solar storm blasted the atmosphere off of Mars and into space. Okay. And uh, immediately, all of the oceans and all of the water on Mars evaporated and, and was gone instantly. Gone. Temperatures raised. There's no atmosphere. There's nothing to keep liquid inside like we do here, right? Thunderstorm. All of that Ooh. left. Then the planet cooled. The core went solid. It stopped. They had no magnetic shield. They had no atmosphere. They've now got a solid core. We've got a molten core. And, and Mars... Yeah, that's it. It's, they lost their magnetism. The, and then, the, then just regular solar flares will gradually eat away their atmosphere. The, the, the planet... That could be why they build in pyramids, too. The, the planet... Under, you know, under heavy stone protection. The planet went solid. It went solid. Now... What if that happened here? What if, I mean, just it, the burp happens off of the sun and the solar storm hits and, and you wake up to no yeah. atmosphere. That's it. That's it. It's over. It's over. So you, you can't control nature. You're just not going to be able to do it. And if you have anything uh, that would indicate something like that happening. Do you want to be the person to talk about it? No, no, you don't. You don't. And well, I just did it anonymously, Jimmy. <laughs> you don't. You don't. You just want to hang out. It is stoppable by just. You want, it is stoppable by just cutting the message. You would hang out with your kids and your dogs until the comment arrives. Lafayette, enjoy your night, man. We'll see you tomorrow on the show for Friday night. Thanks, Jimmy. Bye. Have a great night. It's time to fade to black. Go back, Lee Teppy. All right. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Going to take a quick break. I've got open lines going on. 818-921-6929 or 323-275-9695. I'll be right back with more of your phone calls right after this break. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? Sugar girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, 
Reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hello, Fader Knots. Jimmy Church here, and I know what you're thinking. Lately, Jimmy sounds so fresh. He's so alert. He's so now. Well, that's because of biotech research and their new supplement, Brain Peak 9. Brain Peak 9 contains nine nutrients that may help support brain function of memory, concentration, recall, and improve focus. Other memory supplements can cost as much as 129 bucks for a 60-day supply. But right Right now, for a limited time, if you use the discount code FADER, that's right, F-A-D-E-R, just for the Fader Knots, you'll get a 60-day supply for just 49 bucks. There's no better time than right now to see what others have been raving about. Help improve your brain function. Go to BrainPeak9.com and enter the discount code FADER. That's right, for the Fader Knots. That's BrainPeak9.com. Discount code FADER. And the links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Click on it now. Seriously. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. And I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community. And with my personal invitation, you can right now get your own free 30-day membership at Forbidden knowledge.tv your own library of information starts today at forbidden knowledge.tv your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse kunx db bx are you ready to read about true paranormal events unx media publishes non-fiction books about ufos ghosts and haunted places time anomalies cryptid creatures and more Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game it's a bolder cup with some bite game changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder but it's still dark with wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich balanced full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after dinner coffee or anywhere in between Artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. rivermooncoffee.com Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Open lines right now, 821 821- 818-921-6929 or 323-275-9695. Um, what would you do, right? You got six months, right? And and they let the news out. What do you do? What, what, what do you do? 
That's a that's a great question. And uh, do you you spend it happy, no matter what? But you know what? I I think you just act normally. It, it'd be difficult to do, maybe, or maybe instincts will will kick in, and you will you you know your brain is not going to allow you. Uh, to panic or freak out that you are just going to live normally. And uh, the, the ending of uh, don't look up was Adam McKay handled this so well. And so you had DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence and, and uh, everybody uh, having a dinner at uh, DiCaprio's house and they know, I mean, that's it. It's, it's happening that night during dinner and they just have a dinner and, and they are just having a normal and, and, and to project this correctly, I want to point this out of all things, they start talking about coffee and somebody goes, you know, uh, wow. Mm, this must be fade to black blend. DiCaprio goes, it is. And uh, I grind my own beans. And and the house is shaking, right? The lights are going out. It, it, the comet impact has happened. And that's it. And they're talking about grinding beans and, and coffee. And somebody said, you know, this apple pie and... and um, uh, the, prof- uh, the, uh, the the guy from NASA, the, the Space Protection Agency or whatever it was called, says, I prefer frozen apple pie instead of fresh. Oh, yeah, interesting. And the house is, you know, and the, and the end is near. But that's how Adam McKay chose to project this. And I think that that is actually pretty close. I mean, that's how I would, you know, would I want to be screaming or, or freaking out, you know, and and not to say that any of this is 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 morose or anything like that. But one of the things with uh, don't look back for me was that approach to it and the look at society and us and the media and and politics and it was it was a hard look at us in that movie uh dealt uh, for the most part in a pretty funny way but we have to laugh at ourselves and it was so close to reality that uh for me i felt like and i keep saying this uh, you know about different movies but i felt like i was watching a documentary i really did and now it's gotten to the point where uh for me uh, because I watch so much media, I watch Don't Look Up all the time. I do. I'll be working. Uh, it, it could be the weekend, and and I'm just at that moment. And I, I and I haven't done that with a movie in a long time. I I do that with three movies. Well, now it's Don't Look Up. But uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, I go back to it all the time. And Close Encounters of of a Third Kind, I watch it all the time. I mean, like all the time. It used to be that way with The Godfather. But, um, I mean, all the time. I watch Close Encounters probably twice a month. Uh, 2001, probably once a month. Uh, right now, Don't Look Up, probably 15 times a month. I go back and and watch that movie. And I'll watch it uh, from uh, beginning to end because the ending of the movie is so well done. And uh, I was watching some of the comments. Uh, Let me flip back to it. I was watching some of the comments. Oh, it might have been in Twitter. Uh, Somebody said, ah, six months? Okay. Somebody said, "I I I would rent an excavator and uh, bury an RV. Uh, not a bad idea, actually. You never know. Uh, you just you, you just never know. Um, but uh, would would you prepare? 
would there be a reason to prep? Yeah, yeah. You never know. You want to play the odds. You want to play the long game, and maybe you should do a certain amount of a certain amount of of, of prepping. I, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, I would definitely want to make sure I have my Thunderbird or uh, my Thunderstorm. Um, I, I was sitting here uh, during the break. I didn't even talk about the uh, thunderstorm tonight. And uh, during the break, I was just sitting here smelling it. And I think that the end was near. I would want to make sure that these were humming along so I could go out the right way. <laughs> if you haven't gotten your thunder uh, thunderstorm yet, uh, you've got to check it out. Um, Don't Look Back was a Boston song uh, coming in from Sherman. How you doing, Sherman? Um uh alien baby in the end of the movie what movie was that what movie was that okay uh phone calls uh 818-921-6929 or 323-275-9695 and now i want to go back and 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 talk about the, i uh, maybe i won't have time for phone calls i watch a lot of science fiction and uh there is a, a very cool thing that has gone on for for probably the last two or three years. And I'm not talking about Star Trek since 1968. There is a lot of really good science fiction TV series on. And uh, there are many fantastic movies uh, that, that have come out. Now, I mentioned two. Uh, early on tonight and one of them you know everything everywhere all at once there was a lot of of hype behind this movie and i was reading the reactions uh, to everybody you know saying that it was perfect it was a perfect movie and and so well done i was uh i had pretty high expectations the movie didn't let me down at all but the but that it, it's about the multiverse right and now i finished uh dr strange last night uh I've, I've watched it twice but i watched it in halves and and i finally got to the end last night and it was an excellent ending in that but again about the multiverse right multiverse madness and um and when we think about what has been released in in the last year when it comes to films and and science fiction it's all there but if we like go and pick all of this stuff apart what is outer range about what 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 is it about it's about the multiverse right um uh the oh the the name of it just escaped me right now um uh, uh oh man edge of night uh I, I just can't remember the series on showtime um about uh, a, a portal entrance underneath, you know, someone's home and being able to walk through the door and go onto another planet. Right. Well, this is a, this is a, a successful series. Um, we have right now uh, for all mankind. And if you haven't watched for all mankind, somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago uh, for a list of uh, science fiction to binge on. And, and, you know, and I, I popped out. It was pretty quick, too. Ten, ten series. And I left out uh, For All Mankind. And if you haven't watched it yet, it's on Apple TV. If you haven't watched For All Mankind, you really need to go and check this out. It's a, an alternate history um, series, um, which, again, I'm going to go back to the multiverse. Because the... And I see this... Now, it's like the multiverse is the subject in everything that is being watched right now. And so For All Mankind suggests a different space race that we went to Mars in, in, in 1992. And it was a race uh, uh, with the Chinese, the Russians, and an Elon Musk uh, type of character. Um, and the United States, so it was uh, four different uh, com uh, competitors uh, to get to Mars at the same time. Watch for all mankind. Is it a multiverse show? 
So this is my suggestion uh, to all of this. And this is, I didn't have the time to get to this earlier. Physicists have been talking about this for, for a while now. And there are different versions of the multiverse. There are uh, just a conventional idea that there are different universes going on at the same time, and, and that's it, right? Not concerned about it, but that we are not the only universe. Okay, there's that. Then there is the science fiction version of this uh, to travel to another universe and experience a different version of yourself. Now, that's exactly what uh, uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once is about. And it's exactly what Doctor Strange Multiverse Madness is about. And um, is there, just go with me on this, is there something going on with, with science and things where suddenly this is the message? Is there something going on? We're talking about ET visiting here. We're talking about channeling. We're talking about traveling the vastness of space. Uh, we're talking about, and it, it, it's it's being pushed. So if we go back right now, it's the multiverse, and the multiverse is everywhere, and it's the subject. I had somebody come up, a CEO of a corporation. And uh, came up to me uh, at uh, Disclosure Fest and said, I am all about the multiverse. It's like, wait a minute, what? You're the CEO of what? And and what? This, this was just blurted as like, I can't get away from the multiverse. What is going on? So if we back up and we think about what uh, science fiction was about over the years. And forever, it was about going to the moon. That's it, right? And, and, and fantasizing about that and talking about that and going to the moon and different approaches to it and, and how it would be done and what we would see when we get there. And everything was fault. But you know what happened? We went to the moon. So once that is done, you can't write about it anymore. What? Why would you do a moon movie today unless you do Moonfall, another example? Right? Now, think about that for a second. And these other versions of science fiction that have been written about, uh, satellites in space, telecommunication, uh, teleportation, uh, these different, everything came to pass. Now the conversation is the multiverse and time travel. Is that what is next? And I would suggest that this is the case. And the only reason why, well, there's many reasons, but the main reason why is because this is what physicists are talking about now. In, in a very hardcore sense. The multiverse. I'm fascinated with this. I am absolutely fascinated. So um, the reason why I brought up uh, uh, Mad God today is I can't escape the multiverse right now, and and I'm and I'm reading a lot about it and and uh, in books and presentations and. And I try to find as many scientists online that are talking about this, and I want to hear what they they have to say about the multiverse. And it, it, it's taken over my world. And so last night, as I started to watch Mad God, I thought to myself, this, in a very strange way, if you are going to experience the multiverse, you're not going to, it's not going to be anything that you can relate to. You're going to meet another version of yourself that you can't relate to. You're going to go to another version of New York City. I'm just saying, uh, you know, I'm 
I'm hypothesizing here, but you're not going to write, you could, eh, it kind of feels like New York City, but it's not, um, or, or whatever, or you're going to go to a completely alien planet and not relate to anything. So how do you escape that? How do you experience that? If you want to go and experience the multiverse right now and experience something that you have never seen before in any concept, in any way at all, go and watch Mad God, which is the reason for everything right now in this conversation that I'm having with you. It takes you to a place you've never experienced any of it it is absolutely mind blowing um the the uh atmospheres and the uh, the creation of this visually you can't relate to it you sort of can you have no idea right and you go through and it's just like one intense scene after another and it's relentless and it doesn't stop from the beginning to the end of the film and it's frigging stop motion animation it is so well done now um i've given everybody the warnings um about mad god i think it's a necessary thing i think everybody certainly in this community uh in this audience needs to watch this film but I've given everybody the warnings. It's graphic. Not all the time, but but it is. It's um it's it's intense, it's visually intense, and it's emotionally intense. Um, but it is extremely satisfying because you are being exposed to something that you have no idea what's coming next. You can't relate to anything, and at, at points it's it's terrifying. Um, but it is a totally fun ride. That's that's it, and and that's that's part of uh, 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 a satisfying experience when you uh, when you when you watch a film or you want to be immersed into something. You want all of that. You want to be on edge. You don't want to be comfortable. And this film does all of that. It makes you uncomfortable. You can't stop watching it. You are absolutely wondering what is going to happen next, what door is going to open, what is going to be seen, what is going to be accomplished, what is going on, what's the mission, what is happening here. And that is the multiverse. And that film took me there. It's incredible, but I've given you the warnings. There are there are spots in this that are definitely, uh, ooh, ooh, but it's fun. Okay, and it's 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 definitely a hundred percent for adults. This is the stuff that will freak out a kid for the rest of their lives. <laughs> you do not. You definitely want to be over the age of eighteen or twenty-one before uh, even considering watching this film. You've got to be prepared for it. But um, tomorrow night is Fader Night, so I hope that and you can watch this free. It's on Amazon. Uh, Netflix, Amazon, look it up, Mad God. And that tomorrow on the show uh, will be open lines all night long. I want to hear from everybody about how this film impacted you. And I I don't give uh, suggestions and I don't endorse things uh, too often, but, but when I do, it's, it's, it's right there and it's worth it. So, um, and for me, um, uh I've already started Mad God a second time. I had to just go back and 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 watch it. Um for me, I did uh back to back to back over uh two days. I did everything uh, everywhere all at once. I did uh Doctor Strange, Multiverse Madness, and followed it up with Mad God. So hopefully you've seen a Doctor Strange already. You've seen everything everywhere all at once. And now uh, you need to go see Mad God. And I want to hear from everybody tomorrow night uh, to see what you think about this. Um, there, The other movie that I mentioned earlier before I say goodnight tonight, um, It's Hard to Be a God. Um, that is Russian. It is subtitled. 
Um, but uh, that is very similar in its uncomfortable um, uh, position that you take watching a film. That It's a difficult film to get through. It is about uh, uh, explorers, astronauts from Earth, professors. Uh, 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 they go to this other planet uh, that is stuck in, um, in their evolution phase, like the Dark Ages here. So you have kingdoms and kings and, and things. Um, and so we go there to teach them uh, stuff to advance their society. And they want nothing to do with that. They are happy where they are. Everybody disappears. So uh, an, another party is sent to the planet to rescue who was sent there. And that guy um, is treated like a god. And that's the name of the movie. It's hard to be a god. And what he experiences on this planet through his journey. And it's it's crazy town. It's crazy. So after Mad God, <laughs> go watch. It's hard to be a god. It's funny that God is in both of these uh, titles of these movies. And uh, watch them. And then maybe you'll get a little bit of what goes on inside of my head. All right. I don't recommend stuff often, but when I do, it's the good stuff. All right. So with that, I'm going to get out of here and uh, uh, prepare for fader night tomorrow night. I had a great show earlier today uh, with Christina Gomez. We did um, uh, the, um, uh, we did the the triangle in in Massachusetts, and 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 I'm brain freezing right now. But we're going to do part two next week, and that was a great show today. And I wanted to thank Christina. I uh, forgot to do that earlier tonight uh, for that show earlier today. With that, I'll see everybody tomorrow night for Fader Night. Uh, thanks for uh, everything. Thanks for being Fader Not, and of course, thank you. To Ralph Blumenthal, absolutely lit it up today. Fade to Black is produced by Hill J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitolo, Mark T. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR with the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night is Fader Night, open lines all night long. Until then, be safe. Go Beckley Tepe. Yeah.